welcome, Rob and Teddy. Thank yes, you. thank you very much. I mean, we, we don't talk that much about um, how we do Hokkaido Wilds and, and that kind of thing. We don't have that many opportunities to do so. So it's, it's nice to kind of reflect uh, mm. for ourselves as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you so much for coming in. And uh, can you just give a self-introduction to our audience? Yeah, so um, my name's Heidi and um, I hang out with Rob all the time and we do lots of outdoor stuff. Um, I also uh, work as a associate professor at the university here, Hokusei Gakuen University, in the Tankidag, in the junior college department, it's teaching English. And um, yeah, I love spending time, pretty much all time off work in the outdoors. Yeah. During mm. kayaking, cycling, and canoeing. You both Skiing. have yeah. wild souls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to recharge and, um, yeah, get the mind off work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm, my name's Rob. Um, uh, and along with Heidi, uh, we created Hokkaido Wilds uh, about five years ago now. <gasps> already? Um, yeah, so it's already been about five years. Wow. Um, we're both from New Zealand. Uh, both grew up in New Zealand. Um, I grew up in the very south of the South Island of New Zealand. The best so, part? <laughs> um, I would argue the best part. <laughs> Haiti grew up in the North Island. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, which um, is different. <laughs> <laughs> she would probably argue is the best part. <laughs> oh, that's uh, why you mentioned it's not the best part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so uh, I've been living in Japan for... Uh, but oh gosh, I never can get this right. A total of over fifteen years. <gasps> wow. now. Yeah, yeah, over fifteen years. Yeah, we've, we've both been in Japan for over fifteen years. Wow. Now, um, part of that was in southern Japan, uh, but most of it has been now in Hokkaido. Yes, yeah. So I was uh, the first time I came to Japan, or the, the first time I spent any decent time in Japan, I was in Kyushu. Oh, so very I different place. Yeah, very different place. And Haiti. Yeah, I was in Yamaguchi Ken and Nagoya. Area. So near, near kind of Hiroshima. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nagoya, it's like, a, but, but you you guys are not like a travel together at a point. Mm. So we did live in Nagoya f- together for one year. That's right. Yeah. 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 Before we came to Hokkaido. So, so you can yeah. explore different areas. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, that time, the reason that we were there was because I had got a Japanese government scholarship to study master's um, or study postgraduate oh. studies here in uh, Japan. Um, yeah, so we were there for a year, decided that if we were going to be here in Japan for a long time, we wanted to be somewhere that had more decent winters. Ah, so that's the how powders. we yeah exactly <laughs> so so, th- so that's how we ended up uh in hokkaido yeah um, we also mm. didn't enjoy summer in nagoya yeah, it was, it was very too hot, hot. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah i yeah i get that because i lived there for a year as well and mm. just really warm and a little bit humid but taiwan is more humid <laughs> to be honest yeah. that's what brought you to japan starting from study and then you come to the north hokkaido to trace the powder Hmm. Kind of. I mean, my first experience with Japan, I, I had a Japanese friend when I was 13 years old mm. uh, and ended up coming to Japan with him for three weeks when I was 14, then did a, a, a year um, high school exchange for, uh. Uh, when I was 16 for a year in Fukuoka down in Kyushu. Um, yeah, and that, that was kind of the beginning for me. Um, but, but then, uh, to be honest, and, and then after graduating from uh, university, I ended up being in Kyushu again. <laughs> and after three years there, I'd kind of given up on Japan. I thought, Japan is not really for me. The topography is a little bit too claustrophobic. Mm, yeah. um, it's too hot. The winters, are they feel cold. But not... No powder. <laughs> no, no powder. No, no, no great snow. Um, so I, I'd kind of left Japan for a while, went traveling, um, and then ended back in Japan. And then Haiti had spent time living and working in Hokkaido. So I think it was kind of her experience living here that kind of brought us back up here. Oh. Um, and 
and and yeah so now now when people ask me do i like japan i say i kind of like japan but i love hokkaido yeah yeah because you really tried out like different places mm. and yeah. haiti discovered hokkaido yes yeah <laughs> so th- yeah haiti yeah. D- definitely discovered hokkaido before i even knew about yeah, hokkaido yeah, yeah. yeah i was living in hokkaido for a year before we got together and um yeah was very much recommending that we go there if we were going to be in japan mm. so, yeah yeah you yeah. saw the powder and you yeah i mean it's not all about the powder um mm. it's just like a beautiful environment to live in it's so much yeah more pleasant than honshu mm. so and i think the people yeah. lifestyle is very different than, ho- mm. uh, than other places in in japan as well right yeah yeah like we love the green season yeah. here in yeah. hokkaido mm. yeah summer is great here yeah so. because my uh, my colleagues in hokkaido uh, in iseko like sometimes I check their Instagram, <laughs> social mm. media, and how they live there, like outside of the winter season, still like in the nature and how they raise their kids is always like go mm. out and have fun and just so s- not really city, <laughs> mm-hmm. city mm-hmm. boy, kids, something yep. like that. I just yep. like really like that lifestyle. So, um, so yeah, you moved to the Hokkaido, but what inspired you to start Hokkaido Wilds? Uh, yeah, I mean, I... I had been blogging, so I, I uh, in 2006 to 2009, I traveled around the world. Um, Longboard. Yeah, so skateboard, uh, so uh, by bicycle first, so from Japan to Europe was by bicycle. Wow. And then I switched to the skateboard and, and skateboarded across Europe, the US and China. What? Uh, mainland China. And uh, so I've been blogging about that adventure uh, since 2006. So once we arrived in Hokkaido, um, I was blogging about our cycle trips here in Hokkaido, you know, cycling for two weeks across the island, up and down the island. And it, it kind of, I realized at some point, the comments that I was, that I was, that I was getting on the blog, they were less about um, Haiti and Rob's cycling and there were more about Hokkaido like that people were asking about um is this route good in this month or I I felt like people weren't interested in the fact that Haiti and Rob were adventuring in Hokkaido they were just interesting in uh, interested in adventuring in Hokkaido did you feel sad about that you were not interested in me Uh, I was going to become influencers yeah I don't know I I I don't think so I I I I think I'd always blogged and taken photos yeah. um, to try to kind of communicate and express that the amazing environments that I was traveling through. Yeah. And I felt like this was an opportunity to kind of showcase Hokkaido in a way that hadn't been showcased before. Yeah, yeah so that was when I thought, well, how about, well, what if we change the blog to be a blog focused on Hokkaido mm. as opposed to on Hayden Rob's adventures. Oh, that was uh, the original name no. of the website? No, 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 it wasn't. No, no, <laughs> Hayden Rob's adventures. <laughs> That's um, such a great name. <laughs> yeah. No, so we, yeah, we, we went through a couple of different possible names. Hokkaido Tracks, but then that had already been taken oh. by a, um, a, uh, a real uh, real estate company here what um <laughs> i can't remember the names that we were thinking but yeah we came up with hokkaido wilds and we loved it so yeah yeah, yeah. it's good yeah and so we kind of transferred all of the cycling content from my old blog to hokkaido wilds and then just um yeah i guess uh, just started exploring other things as well hiking and skiing and yeah, there are so many categories in your website. So yeah, I, I just, um, I really wonder how did you connect with other outdoors because you both are the founders, but there's also many in, uh, contributors. In, how did you meet all those people? It's just life. Like um, mm. you, you make friends with people who have common interests. And I think a lot of the people that are contributors are friends mm. Mm. and um, yeah. Did you tell them to, hey, come visit me in Hokkaido? <laughs> well, some no. of, a lot of them have li- uh, have been li- uh, kind of long-term residents or... Um, yeah, at the, the moment... Come and go a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, Timber 
Um, uh, he lives in Shimakapu. He's an American. He's lived here for two years now. Um, and soon after he arrived, um, someone mentioned to him Hokkaido Wilds. Yeah. And so he kind of contacted us oh. through a person who had um, you know, suggested that he might want to get in contact. And, and he's now just an, an amazing um, uh, kind of team member um, <laughs> you know, with, with incredible experience in expeditioning and um, outdoor you know, leading wow. um, groups of people and stuff. So um, I guess when you start publishing information about the outdoors, it kind of attracts like-minded people like flies <laughs> like <laughs> just, flies <laughs> yeah they're just kind of drawn to this um yeah to the information and and, and it's really it, for us i think it um expands our social um experience here right yeah. so it's, uh, because originally i thought it was you have some uh, searching some local group um to connect with the community sort of thing because I, I was one I asked this question was mm. because as a visitors who come here I wonder how we get to know all those people like the mm. communities mm -hmm. and into but I, first I need to improve my Japanese I guess <laughs> right yeah we we I mean so we're part of the Hokkaido outdoor yep. network um, which is a kind of a loose network of um, outdoor operator like um kind of adventure operators um educators uh, researchers government officials um and yeah i mean being able to speak the language uh is is a big part of being able to be part of that community entrance um, level language <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's if, if you're able to kind of communicate um in japanese it, it opens a few more doors, right. I think. Um, but generally, in terms of our own adventures, um, yeah, it's been a lot of kind of expat friends and connections that we've made over the years. Mm. Mm. Wow. And it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, because I saw, I remember this one post you were saying about like the resource and mm. You also discover that many people they come visit, but mostly the information is in Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's also yep. similar, like in Taiwan, we also have this up-to-date information, but it's mm. all in Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've always kind of felt that there, it's a little bit unfair mm. that there's this kind of great firewall of language mm. that kind of uh, means that uh, for visitors who don't speak Japanese. Their access to amazing skiing, um, you know, amazing remote places, is really limited because of that language. Yeah. Um, and so Hokkaido Wilds, in a way, is a place where we can kind of break down those language barriers a little bit, so people have that information um, and can explore. So, yeah, I mean that, that's a big uh, fulfilling part of it, mm. I think, yeah. for me at least. Mm. Yeah, ha have the information in English. In English, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have so many adventures, mm. and then have you ever encountered some um, dangerous uh, challenges or any surprises that you have uh, encountered in the past few years when you're doing like exploration? Mm. I think um, Rob is really good at having uh, redundancy packed into our packs. So wherever we go, we've always got um, extra clothing and extra food and extra everything for if something happens and we have to mm. spend the night out or spend a lot of time in one place because someone's injured or mm -hmm. cold like having some kind of sickness problem yeah i think um so, so we only got into paddling mm. uh, about four years ago so about four years ago we started getting into uh, canoeing mm. and if there's anything dangerous about that was just our extreme level of ignorance In your uh, because you don't know yeah like we, we don't we didn't know what we didn't know yeah if you know what i mean like so, so there's there's um when you're learning a new skill or when you're going into the outdoors there's kind of known unknowns mm. it's kind of like I, okay i know that i'm not sure what this weather forecast that i'm looking at on my app 
what that means in the mountains, right? Okay. So I, I know that I don't know uh, what this weather forecast means for actually the conditions on the ground. But then there's also unknown unknowns. It's like I, I, don't, I don't actually yeah. know what I don't know. In other words, I, I don't know what I need to know. <laughs> yeah. And I think for us, when we started out paddling, there was a lot of that. Like mm. we, we could read books about canoeing. Um, did you take the course for the training or anything? Uh, we did. Yeah, oh, we took okay. yeah. two. Yeah, we took a couple of um, like private lessons with a local guide, and mm. um, yeah, and then we did a lot of watching videos and mm. reading books and pra- mm. just going out and practicing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, similar to the sea kayaking, right? Yeah, I exactly. See you also do the training. Yeah, I think. Um, so, for example, the first time that we paddled down the Kushiro River, mm. um, we had a few tense moments of disagreement about how we should go across certain um, or, or face certain challenges in terms of uh, rapids and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah but yeah. not dangerous. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think. Uh, to a certain extent, publishing the Nisiko backcountry map. Uh, you know, I, I think I expected that there'll be some pushback on um, from locals, um, and there was. So that that was a, a challenge of of being able to respectfully engage with um, the concerns of of locals who um, have kind of seen. Uh, the Hokkaido ski scene change over the years right. and try to kind of interface with that and, and connect with that in a respectful way that um, got our uh, kind of way of seeing things across while at the same time not ignoring the concerns of mm. others. So that that was a challenge, I think, um, publishing the, the map. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, I'm not sure when you mentioned about the pushback, does that mean the local, like why do people, they push back in what terms? Yeah, I, I think, um, so 10 years ago, um, the, the hills in Nisiko especially, uh, there wasn't really that much competition on the slopes for good powder. Mm. For backcountry. For backcountry, yeah. So we're, so we're talking backcountry here, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The resorts, um, uh, completely different. But um, so we're talking about backcountry skiing, um, hiking up for um, skiing down slopes. Uh, and over the last ten years, there's been just a, a, a continual increase in the number of skiers, um, both domestic Japanese skiers mm. and international skiers uh, in the backcountry. So there's some concerns over. Um, you know, you could, and maybe 10 years ago, you could rock up to the trailhead park um, at 10 a.m., yeah. um, hike up uh, and still have fresh powder at 12 noon or 1 o'clock. Nowadays, um, you, know, you have to be there quite early mm. to get um, good first tracks in some locations. Uh, and so I think there's some legitimate concerns over parking issues uh, yeah. um, and also some uh, maybe closer to resort areas that um, might tend to get a little bit more tracked up sooner. So so there's d- definitely, can I think, legitimate concerns over the number of people that are accessing the backcountry. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I, I definitely agree with those concerns and I think um, wherever backcountry skiing is popular, you have those concerns, but then you also have the other concern of you've got lots of people accessing the backcountry um, that don't have a decent map, mm. um, that don't have information about uh, how to park respectfully and, and, and how to um, kind of be good skiers oh. in the context of, of say, Nisco skiing. So um, kind of balancing that increase of access that comes with publishing a map, but also um, the legitimate um, need for information and need for education. Right, yeah. yeah. If people are just gonna go anyway, why don't you give them like the information where should you park mm. the car? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's our thing. stance. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that um, regardless of, 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 the, of if our physical map, regardless of whether, or, or Hokkaido Wilds is a website, regardless of whether that exists or doesn't exist, um, the cat is out of the bag. Yeah. Right. That um, Hokkaido just has amazing backcountry skiing. Um, so people are going to come. Mm. Um, so people need to be educated. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. I was yeah. thinking, how are you gonna like uh, convince them in these terms? Like, you need to set up the laws or something like that. But mm. I think this is like an even better result. Like, yeah, I mean, what, what we I think what we're seeing is more and more action um, mm. on the part of people who are more involved in the backcountry scene than we are um, over safe access, um, education. Um, you know, rescue uh, facilities, um, mm. rescue gear that's available for um, kind of first responders. And um, I think it is it is the backcountry skiing uh, scene in Hokkaido in general is becoming more mature, I think. Wow. Yeah. Is it only happening in recent years? Yes. Yep. I thought like backcountry must be like many, many years because powder in Hokkaido is well known for many years maybe no no I, I think my image of the backcountry skiing scene in Hokkaido from about 10 years ago until seven years ago oh, um, really? was was felt like a bit of a bit of like a bit like the wild west wow. um, whereas now uh, over the last three or four years um, it really has matured and and there's some um, you know we've got better uh, avalanche forecasting uh, systems we've got uh, more cooperation between guides for uh, first response for search and rescue. Yeah, I think I think it's becoming a lot more mature, and and um, mm. that's really really uh, yeah, really positive. Yeah. yeah, I think you guys must contribute a lot <laughs> in this <laughs> process. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, mm. yeah, I, I think in, <laughs> in terms of information for sure. Mm. Um, in terms of actual professional um, on the ground. Uh, guiding on the ground, uh, search and rescue response, um, all, all the stuff that really matters. Uh, we have very little um, involvement. We have very much, uh, very little skill mm -hmm. and expertise in that area. Um, and, and that's where I think it's it's really good to see um, foreign um, kind of backcountry operators and local Japanese backcountry operators really working closely now together oh, um, nice. with the government as well mm. um, with local uh, councils uh, to really um, make it a, a more mature space yeah. do you think this community like in Hokkaido in terms of the older all kind of outdoor is very like inclusive like they really accept foreigners especially for you both are like from overseas how do they? How do mm. you feel about mm. being in this community? Is it? Do you ever have a hard time to uh, fitting in? We don't, um, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that we're very fluent in Japanese. So, mm. so I, I feel that um, that there is still a very big language barrier. Um, you know, luckily that there are foreign. Uh, sorry, that there are local. Um, you know, backcountry professionals here who have a very good command of English so they can work very closely with um, foreign uh, outfits and, and um, kind of get that collaboration going um, but where that language barrier exists uh, I've heard that it, um, it can be difficult to, mm. um, to foster collaboration um, even though on both sides there's a real desire to collaborate and a real desire for um, the different worldviews to be mm. uh, accepted and and uh, yeah, kind of melded together, um, and it, it just doesn't happen when you when there's a language barrier. I think even Google Translate doesn't work. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. In a um, in a town hall kind of a oh. situation, right? When you're when you're perhaps discussing avalanche forecasting right. systems and and what should be in place and that kind of thing it it becomes very difficult very quickly mm. even chat gpt at this point cannot <laughs> uh, keep work. up with that kind of thing yeah and um, can you recommend some of your favorite rap? well we um just this last weekend we did a um circumnavigation mm. of lake shikotsu 
which um, isn't on the site, but yet. yeah, yet. But there are um, on the site we do have shikotsu routes, uh, like shikotsu routes mm. for paddling, and that's a beautiful location to paddle. And I think you were there on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just went yep. back on there, but I didn't. I didn't get on the lake. Oh, oh okay. It okay. was the second, like most cleanest uh, lake in Ho- in whole Japan. Mm. Mm. There's yep. there's some amazing really clarity. amazing. Um, places from the water when you're paddling to, that you get to view the colors and the transparency and wow um mm. the i guess the volcanic under underwater cliffs and stuff are really fantastic you so can see it from a boat yeah because mm. mm. it's clear yeah, mm. Whoa. yeah. i'm going about it yeah you should <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go there. so that's yeah. that's a favorite yeah and, and it's it's not just uh the beauty i think also the the edginess of it, mm-hmm. there's a certain level, level of uncertainty when you're um, on Lake Shikotsu, right? Mm. The, the weather and yeah, yeah. I mean, we did a full day, and um, in that time, we had all sorts of weather. We had beautiful, calm conditions, sunshine. We had waves and wind in mm. the day. Mm. Yep, and we had there was a thunderstorm in the distance, <laughs> mm. and Ooh. that kicked up the waves and the waves were coming to, over to us and then it calmed down again and then we had rain and then we had a rainbow so mm. if um yeah and the more into the middle of the lake you go the more exposed you are to those kind of conditions mm. so our paddling in the weekend really um a lot of people get into trouble on lake shikotsu um because you start out and it's nice and then the weather suddenly changes right. so um it really uh, showed us that um, that does, you know, like the weather does change quickly and also the aspect where, where you are, if you've just come around a corner of a bay or something, the the water condition, the waves can be quite a lot different. So, um, mm. yeah, there is a whole lot of... Um, surprise. Yeah, surprise <laughs> element mm. with Lake Shikotsu, mm. but keep close to shore and mm. you should be all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think um, f- for me... For any of the routes that we have on Hokkaido Wilds, the the higher the level of uncertainty, mm. the more interesting for me. You're looking for the wild challenges, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's like if if there's, um, I mean, I would say almost all of the routes, um, there's always an escape option. Mm. Right? There's always an option of saying, okay, we want to get from A to B, it's going to take five days to do it, or even a day to do it. Um, but there's always an option of, okay, we're on to day two, and we need to get out of here. But there's, there's usually an option to escape from the route and just go to the nearest onsen and enjoy and, enjoy and, and relax. Um, uh, but so, for example, the Daisetsuzan Grand Traverse, uh, it's a six to eight day hike across the Daisetsuzan <laughs> National Park in, in central Hokkaido. Wow. Um, it's 98% above the tree line. So you're up in the Alpine and even in summer you can get um, one degree temperatures. Yeah. Um, when we were doing it, um, we had to sit out a, a typhoon for two days. Unfortunately, um, somebody just a couple of kilometers away from us um, didn't get to the hut that they wanted to do uh, to, to get to, and they got caught out um, and ended up dying of hypothermia. Oh my god! You know, so it's it's a really serious kind of environment. Right. Um, but if you plan well um, and if if you're really conservative um, in terms of the decisions you make, um, it can be uh, you know really really amazing experience. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I think we got lucky in the end that uh, after the typhoon, we had four days of beautiful weather. So we smashed out six days worth of walking in four days. Mm. Um, you yeah. know, big, long, kind of 11 hour walking days. But uh, yeah, I think that, that was a highlight. Yeah, that Traverse is uh, amazing mm. landscape and yeah. um, mountain flora, like mm. the, the um, flowers and plants and and see everything from different like high altitude right yep. yeah, yeah. yeah I and wonder the, the peakers the peakers mm. little uh yeah. s- squeaking rodent things oh. 
Makes them sound terrible, but they're really cute. <laughs> Naki, Naki Usagi. Naki Usagi, yeah. yeah. I wonder, because you mentioned about there's typhoon,、mm. and did you, did you know there is a typhoon, but you still keep still going? Yeah, we actually knew that there、mm. was a typhoon on the way,、yeah. but we knew that we had time to get to a safe hut、mm. yeah. before it arrived. So we did that, and we got to the hut, and we knew at that point we were going to be sitting out the typhoon in the hut, and we had taken enough food with us to have those extra days of just、mm. not travelling and just waiting for the the good weather to come.、Mm. So it's all like into your account, and then you all prepared. Yeah, yeah exactly. Before you set up. Yeah, so so we we had、uh, so we I think we'd originally planned on ten,、uh, so eight days of walking.、Mm. And then had carried so an extra two days of food, because we just knew that、um, if we were gonna、uh, increase our chances of actually finishing the whole walk, we needed to have two days of of sitting out storm kind of、mm. days up our sleeves. So we had those two days. We had the two days of food.、Um, yeah, so th- that's a big part of、uh, just outdoor adventures in, in general. Just having that extra. Like Hattie said, the redundancy in、yeah. terms of、um, safety,、uh, in terms of food, in terms of gear. So,、um, because you said you both are growing up in New Zealand, I'm really curious. <coughs> I'm really curious. Did did you、um, get like a outdoor education when you grew up? I did.、Mm. Like, a, so I, I was in Scouts for a couple of years、mm. um, at school. We had overnight hike. I think that must have been kind of middle school. Yeah, we had、um, overnight hike in、mm. my school as well. Yeah, and、um, yeah, hiking, and、um, and we also had overnight like、uh, in my high school years. We had an overnight. It was like three nights maybe. We did kayaking、wow. and then、mm. um, hiking and cycling, all in the same trip. And、um, you know, you had. To take all your gear with you and、mm. be prepared to get wet and cold and yeah yeah、Sorry. yeah so like、um, and I think in New Zealand especially、uh, y- from a very young age you just get drilled into you the danger of exposure and、right. hypothermia like that's that's、um, you know but people when they think about hiking and outdoor adventures in Hokkaido they're like oh bears yeah <laughs>、um, right、We、might get killed by a bear. Yeah. And the the reality, like we've got a、um, search and rescue database on Hokkaido Wilds,、um, where we translate from Japanese to English、um, the Hokkaido Police search and rescue data, and just by far, by far, the the main killer and the main reason why people have to get rescued is because of exposure, is because of hypothermia. They、oh. get caught out in bad weather and they they just don't have the gear to deal with it. Um, yeah, so I, th- I think that,、uh, in terms of training in New Zealand, is is a big part of. I think what what we, yeah, is why, I mean, we don't get caught out that often in bad weather, but I'd like to think that if we did,、um, you know, we'll be prepared for that because we just have had that as part of our growing up.、Mm. So, do you mention the, Hedy?、Uh, you mentioned you have like three days trip. Was it in your middle school?、Um, so I in high school. So when I was like sixteen、um, years old, why?、Yeah. And you guys have to carry everything by yourself. Yeah, I think.、Um, That's a strange question. I mean, it's a long time ago. It's a long time ago. But、um, I think when we did the cycling, I think someone was taking the gear with a van or something. But、um, hiking. The hiking, we carried a certain amount of gear ourselves. Yeah. So I think it, it wasn't completely unsupported. I think it was、mm. definitely supported by some kind of、um, other like、how、transports. Wh- when you go to this kind of outdoor trip、um, it, for school, do they have to have a lot of teacher or instructors go together to protect all the children? Yeah, I mean, like I say, it was a long time ago, and I can't remember how many people were in the group and how many instructors we had. But、um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you the ratio. But it was、yeah. probably at least a couple of、uh, of teacher style people with us. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say like in a class of thirty, 
there'd be a couple of only two two teachers and maybe two teachers wow no that that was many years ago maybe it's gotten um different now but yeah because i think like mostly in taiwan the teacher they were too scared even mm. just for going to the park they were scared because they have to take care of so many kids they right, would get right. like really out of control yeah, yeah. not yeah. to mention to bring them to hiking or something they, yeah that's i think the i think um the experiences that i reflect back on um it wasn't any old teacher who was it wasn't mm. all of the teachers it was teachers who wanted to or who had kind of outdoor background mm. they were mm. taking a, a group of students who wanted to do outdoor stuff to do outdoor stuff mm. so oh, the students choose yeah if they want to yeah, go yeah. Or for that three-day trip particularly that was like a um yeah self-selected choose to go wow trip. yeah that's so nice did you um, the children, uh, like students, they can also ju- inv- get involved of planning the trip. Um, maybe these days they probably can, but back in that day, um, <laughs> I don't remember being involved in planning. <laughs> well, at, at my school, we had sixth form, uh, so second to last year of high school expedition or or something. There, there was a um. Oh, maybe South and North is very different. It could be different, mm. but um, <laughs> no. But there, there was so, so there was this option where basically students themselves would organise uh, a trip, mm. and uh, there'd be no there'd be no uh, teacher present. It was uh, the idea is that the students would submit their plans and say this is what we plan to do, um, and then they go do it, and then they'd write a report about it afterwards. Wow. Um, yeah, so some students would go on a kind of three-day backcountry um, mountain biking trip and some would go tramping, as we call it, tramping. We call hiking tramping in New Zealand. Mm. Go for a three-day tramp, uh, that kind of <laughs> thing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because I also, um, when I interviewed, there's a Taiwanese who moved to New Zealand mm. and he mentioned about the insurance for even the workers who mm. get injured mm-hmm. into if they get outdoor and they yep. injured, they couldn't work and they have like really good mm. um, backup from the government yes. or for yes. insurance company. Yeah, so, so that's a big, I think a really big difference um, yeah. between say New Zealand and even Japan yeah. is that um, there is the ACC, the Accident Compensation something um <laughs> but, but there's the, yeah there's yeah. the uh the government scheme that if if you injure yourself in an accident you don't pay for medical um care you don't pay so for crazy. um you know lost time on work so that kind of insulates operators a lot from liability mm. um yeah so i think on the other on the other hand, it's really motivate people. Don't you worry, go outdoor. I get yes, your back. Yep, for sure. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah. yep, yep. Even, I think even like tourists who just landed in New Zealand, they got uh, like partially covered by this. Yes, they are. No, they're, they're 100% yeah. covered. Yes. Wow. Yep. Yep. So crazy. I'm going to move to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. Wilds，叮叮，叮叮，Hokkaido Ni 山的介绍都可以在这个地图里面找到所以如果大家有兴趣的话
，其实，在台湾也买得到，就是 Amazon 啊，或者是呃，如果你有去二十股的话，在 Rhythm 那边你也可以买得到。那 Irene 都会把相关的链接放在下面哦。Yeah, thank you so much. It's a video. <笑>